Hey, it's Chronologically Gaming, the only channel that's perpetually retro because we're playing every video game in order of release. Well, we've done it. We finished all the releases in 1981 that we could find a release for, and now we're going through all the other games that were in 1981 that were released at some point in 1981. So if you thought we were done with 1981, oh no, we are far from finished. Are you ready for this? This is us playing all the games that were released at some point in 1981 in alphabetical order. So if we couldn't find the actual release date for them, you better bet they are very obscure. They're kind of weird, they're kooky, and you might think to yourself, wait, that's a video game? Or I've never heard of that one because that's the territory we are going to. Here we go with our first game. In alphabetical order, we are gonna play 3D, 3D, or is it 3D, 3D? This is on the, okay, so moving forward, if we see any more uh, ZX80 games for the home computer, I'm going to say them as yank as possible and just say they're the, it's a ZX80, but this is the ZX81. So every time we see this, it is always the ZX81. This is, in the bottom left corner, the very good computer that you could have for the time for the cheapest price. So if you got a few quid in your pocket, that's the one you'd be getting. Uh, the, the, the brand new ZX81. So this is 3D 3D. I don't even know what this one's about. Let's see what's going on with this one. As far as artwork, that's all we have. We don't even have a box for this. Most of these games were still around the same age of kits for computers that people assemble together. So these games are cassettes. And when you say that the game has a box or a case, it just means it has like a little literal cassette tape and that's the box. So this one, we don't even have that for. So here we go. Let's pop in our cassette and play some ZX81. Released sometime in 1981. Here's 3D 3D. Oh, by Jeff Minter. That's pretty cool. All right. So this is the keyboard for the ZX81. You can see it's very, I guess, trying to get the functions all in one place. But to get this to go, we need to first run and then enter or function new line. And there we go. Welcome to 3D. 3D! The most original 3D view maze program. Presented by DKtronics. Original? Uh, we'll be the judge of that. Alright, so the, the, the leaders in ZX81 hardware. Okay. Nice. So 3D 3D is unique in being the only program to present itself in a 3D view of a maze, which itself is three-dimensional. The program presents the maze in a form of a cube, 11 by 11 by 11. You're placed on the lowest level at the front, you must get to the exit on the top level 10 on the back wall. What in the world? So you got to get to Z10, Y10. A 3D view of your surroundings is generated and displayed along with your X, Y, and Z coordinates and your orientation. Oh my gosh. So it's a three-dimensional, three-dimensional maze. Not just... Um, uh, it's, the maze itself isn't two-dimensional. It's a three-dimensional maze. So it looks like they have a score they give us. The map read, you can press question mark uh, to get orientation of where you are. And 10 points are added if you see the map. Map shows the level you're on and position and shafts leading up. All right, so seems kind of confusing, especially for a, a, a system that is primarily in the United Kingdom. So uh, here we go. For directions, we got 5, 6, 7, and 8, which if you look on the keyboard itself, 5, 6, 7, and 8 are the arrow keys on the ZX81. Orientation is absolute. If you face right and the screen shows turning on the left side of the screen, you look forward. If not, uh, not left, if you choose to look in. Sure. And then to move, new line moves you in one step in the direction of your current orientation. Please, please note that you look into or into enter turning in, oh gosh, so it's already getting confusing. So a three-dimensional maze with a three-dimensional uh, view, viewpoint. So that means I guess it was first person is what we're going to get. And lots of instructions. Oh my gosh. We're going to be reading until the end of time. Pressing W allows you to have enhanced display in the form of OFS, hated walls. They look a little longer to, oh, they take a little longer to draw, but they look nice and W toggles them off. Okay, so lots of different commands we can do on our computer. And here we go. <laughs> it says, hang on. I am setting the maze, which means I wonder if they are making this random. This is uh, one of the first games we played on the channel for the ZX81. Sorry, I take a while. Yeah, you do take a while. Speed it up, why don't you? I just pushed spacebar and I may have broken the game. I hope not, because I was trying to fast forward to see if it would work, and it looks like it is not. Darn, I did. I broke the game. Oh, I can't believe it. Okay, so, uh, yeah, going back. These computers are so finicky with whether they're going to break or not. So we'll boot it up again. I will not try to fast forward. It did not like that. All right, and again, pulling up our keyboard, going to run, and new line. 
and we'll just skip through all the instructions, pretend we read everything. Everybody take your notes of how to play 3D 3D. And then it's going to build our maze for us. Setting the maze now. This is one of the games that would have been concluded on a compilation of a cassette tape. So you'd buy a cassette tape at the store in uh, Europe, and then on that cassette tape would be several smaller games, uh, and this would be one of the ones included on it, um, for the most part. Uh, if this was a standalone, it'd be very rare. A lot of the times, uh, people wanted the bargain of having several games on one. Okay, here we go. So, Maze is loading. Yes, and it's drawing. It works. Oh, man, we really do need fast forward, though. If uh, the fast forward key is going to break, uh, oh my gosh, yeah, look at this. So it's a first person perspective and it's drawing line by line the maze. Wow. And I wonder if we, if we, if we move, it has to redraw everything again. Yes, and it's still going. Still drawing. Yep, there you go. Take your time. We got all day. Everyone get, uh, get some tea and uh, we'll sit back and play some ZX81. Wow, still going. Still waiting. So it, it uh, finally, <laughs> so it uh, drew the maze. Now we're going to walk forward. Oh my gosh. It's going to draw it all again with one move. It's going to draw the whole thing. Oh man. So this is the uh, slowest first person three-dimensional maze we played yet so far on the channel. And keep in mind, we have played things like a Calabeth that has a first-person perspective maze. But, uh, <laughs> oh, maybe th this is the non-fast option. And we should try W to see if that uh, makes it better. Let's try it and see what happens. I don't think it's going to let me do the command until it actually loads up first. I kind of think this is the fast mode. And then if I do the higher resolution or the, 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 uh, the more detailed mode, it's going to take even longer. All right, so just to be sure... Yeah, it's W. Here we go. Okay, so new walls. And looks like nothing's doing anything yet, so I'm going to st step forward. Moving forward. And keep in mind, we're playing this on a uh, fast, ba uh, fast booting cassette tape. And the emulator itself is running it faster than the original. Oh my gosh, yes. So we were playing on the lower mode, and now they're going to draw in every single line of the... <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, wow. All right, so we're now in a new dimension. We've already seen a few games from Europe, and that was from the console space. From the computer space, we haven't done too much because we haven't played computers that were involved with kits that you built yourself. This is uh, at, released after the, Z, the ZX80. This is the ZX81. And so this is uh, meant to be the better, slightly better system. And th still, though, compared to every other game we played for the time, I'm going to stop it there. That, that is basically unplayable, even for the time to wait that long. There must have been a lot of tea drinking happening in Europe to get 3D, 3D to load. So I'm going to go down to the Broken Range. That is uh, pretty much unplayable. It does uh, have the cool uh, aspect of a three-dimensional maze with a three, 3D view, but I'm just going to give it half star. I'll give it a little bit, but oh man, 3D, 3D needs to speed it up. All right, so let's see what our next release is. After that, we are still on the ZX81, and this is 3D Defender. Maybe Arcade Clone Defender. Let's see. So for the box, there it is. It is the cassette tape 3D Defender by New Generation Software. You got to have 16K in your ZX81. <laughs> All right. And then uh, let's see. Additional apps. Okay. We just got di two different versions of it. Let's pop in the cassette and play. Release at some point in 1981. This is 3D Defender for the ZX81. And it just booted right into it. That's nice. So we got forward radar coming on. Our civilization's under attack. Yours is the last craft of our once noble battle fleet. You must defend our planet to the last. To the last. 250 points will be awarded for each kill, but if any alien lands, 50 points will be deducted. These may be regained if it subsequently takes off and attacks you. Beware of the alien's plasma weapons. Your shield can only withstand 10 hits. Good luck. So this is 3D Defender, and first time we've checked this one out, uh, the ZX81 did not have a dedicated joystick. So for controllers, it was all keyboard. And mo for the most part, oh, scramble, scramble, scramble. For the most part, it uses the arrow keys that you can see as five, six, seven, eight, which means as far as an emulation standpoint, even then you can see the keyboard uh, has five, six, seven, eight right next to each other. So whenever you were playing this in 1981, you literally had all four of your fingers on those keys. And then the same for me, I'm playing all four fingers on the keys. Here we go. I'm in. 
right, so to move around, it looks like I can... Okay, so yeah, the arrow keys are working correctly, but um, it is, it's, it's running faster than 3D 3D. What's my shoot button, though? Oh, that's cool. Okay, so it is giving a really cool three-dimensional view of the game, but I don't see what my laser shot is. We didn't get a manual for this one either, so let's try A, Z. Oh, there we go. Okay, so we get Z is the attack. And as we move around, yeah, wow. Oh, they got the cool flashing effects. The other thing, too, is there's very limited sound on the ZX81. So if you're thinking there's a problem with audio, there's not. It's it's just the, the way it was at the time. And you can see we have three-dimensional ships that are coming by and, and, and shooting us. This is reminiscent of uh, some of the games we played for the Commodore PET. But uh, keep in mind, Commodore PET came out in 77, uh, the first model. And this is 1981, and we're now playing the, the newest cutting-edge games for... Um, not the not the most cutting edge computer. This is the budget system that you would have in in Europe. But uh, cool idea. That's pretty much all we'll play for three D Defender. But I got to give it props for uh, the viewpoint. A first person game for the ZX eighty one is awesome. Yes, cheapest too. You got a few quid in your pocket? Just go buy a ZX eighty one. All right, so for this one, uh, for the time of considering every other computer game we played for the time, we're not going to base this as just in Europe. We're going to play it as a global scale of all video games. Uh, we we kind of branch them apart if it's a computer, arcade, or handheld. So for 3D Defender, though, from all the other games we played on the home computer space, it's still about average for what you see for the time. I'm going to go two and a half stars for 3D Defender. Uh, it works really well. And if you had a ZX81 in Europe, this would be a, a really good game to have. All right, so with that, after 3D Defender, let's see what our next game is. All right, now we're going to the other end of the spectrum from uh, Europe. This is the Acorn Atom, which is uh, released at around the same time as the uh, ZX80. So uh, we haven't had really good luck playing Acorn Atom games, and I don't know how it's going to work so well with this one. This is 747, which is a uh, jumbo jet flight simulator game, and there's a lot of games that are titled 747. Let's take a look at the box for 747. Acorn added by Bug Bite Software, and you can see this is the uh, cassette tape box of what you would, would have seen in it. There it is, with their address in Liverpool. We're going to England, playing some games. So for this one, it's a different emulator, and it is very tricky to work with. Last time we tried it, we didn't get so lucky with it, but uh, we hopefully have worked out the kinks. So released at some point in 1981, this is 747. All right, so right off the bat, we have to load the tape itself and instead of it auto-booting. Uh, so it's very, very clunky in that respect. You have to find the file itself and then go for the load. And then after you load, you have to know what the uh, name of it is on the cassette. So you have to look at the cassette catalog or the, the, the tape catalog. Okay, so it looks like we're loading 747. And um, similar to uh, other chiclet keyboards, this one uh, is only, it's very, very slow. You can't type it quick like uh, modern day keyboards. So here we go, loading 747 and now playing the tape. <laughs> yeah, that's the way to do it. Sounds just like a modem, but uh, wait a second, error six. Oh no, so we're supposed to be able to run this. Error six means there's an issue with the disc. Darn. So that means, sadly, this one will not uh, run because the cassette is bad. So if anyone has a good cassette of 747 for the Acorn Atom, then we'll we'll play it again. But otherwise, we're going to have to give that one a... I'm going to give it a zero. You couldn't even run because the cassette didn't work. Too bad. All right, sadly, that is not a good track record for the Acorn Atom. But there it is in the bottom left corner. This one is a more powerful computer than the uh, ZX80, definitely. And uh, Z uh, ZX81, it's, a, it's comparable, but it has a much better keyboard. And after 747, let's see what our next release is. We're trekking through playing every game released at some point in 1981. And here we go. It's the 747 Landing Simulator for the Atari home computer. And this one we are not strangers to. We've already seen plenty of games for this one. Take a look at this ad for the Atari home computer at the time. Atari brings you a dazzling variety of software for the Atari home computer. Billy, Dad and I think you're old enough now. What's that? Atari software. Is that soft? It's what you put into the computer to make it work. Software that keeps track of things. Software? Where's my allowance? 
Software like Pac-Man, Atari's the only home computer that oh, has Oh yeah, it. gotta put the games in. The language that makes programming easy. Software to educate, challenge, excite. Someday, Billy, this will all be yours. Really? Wow, Billy, that's right. Someday it'll all be yours. All right, so for this game, uh, this is going to be a, a flight simulation game. Hopefully it's just a landing like it says. But uh, let's check out a box for the 747 landing simulator for your Atari home computer. This is by APX or the Atari Program Exchange. They do their boxes very, like this is software for a computer. Not really super fun, uh, considering the boxes we've seen for Apple II. But there you go. That's the box for the 747 landing simulator. And we have a manual for this one. That always helps for home computer releases. This is it. The 747 Landing Simulator Manual. And, oh man, yeah, it looks like a lot of pages. So very technical, complicated, because they're looking for something realistic that you could play on your home computer for the Atari uh, 800. And you can see we got two different ones, the cassette or disc version. We'll be playing on the disc, because uh, we got all the money in 1981, and we're going to use it. Let's see how to play this. 747 Landing Simulator by William J. Graham. Way to go, William. Program and manual contents. You can see it says 1982 because there's actually two versions of the manual. This is the, the newer version that came out in 1982, but it was released in 1981 with another manual. This one has more information, looks a little bit better, more streamlined than uh, the 1981. And this is kind of interesting. Look at the trademarks of Atari at this time. Uh, Atari has the 400 computer, the 800 computer, the 410 program recorder, the 810 disk drive, the 820 40 column printer, the 825 80 column printer, the 822 thermal printer, the 830 acoustic modem, and the 850 interface module. So there you go. That's what's out right now that you can have in, uh, the, for the Atari computer space or the Atari 8-bit computer, if that's your flavor. All right, so they're going to give us some overview. There's our table of contents. You can see how many pages this is. This is uh, at least a 20-page manual, which is pretty lengthy uh, for the time. And we got uh, illustrations. Nice. Intro oh, wait, I didn't see any illustrations here. Oh, I guess you can see that on those uh, pages. So uh, uh, landing simulator is a game of realistically simulating the airport runway. Okay, so we've um, checked out a few simulators for computers on the channel. And what we usually do is to get a taste of it, we just boot it up to see what it looks like and play and understand that you can you can dive in a lot more, uh, explain a lot more in the manual. And at the time, this would be the kind of game that you would want to work to practice and, and get better at. But we do not have the time for that for this channel. We kind of just give you uh, kind of just the feels of what it would be like to boot up and play a flight simulator. All right, so after that, we have, oh yeah, what's required to play. We're going to be playing the disc version and then how to load uh, 747 landing simulator. We can skip by these because our loading is going to go pretty easy. We do want to see this, how to land the aircraft. So the initial game screen is going to show uh, different inf information, uh, 747 score, instruments on, and, and so forth. That explains what all those mean. And then the game summary is you're supposed to do initial flight parameters in the land of the aircraft and the standards by which you're awarded a score. The landing begins with the aircraft. It reaches an altitude of 5,000 feet. For optional landing, you have enough fuel for your approach. And then time is another thing to consider. And they're going to have all this on the screen for us, I'm pretty sure. And then do they have graphics is the big thing. We've seen some simulators that are only text. So here, controls. Joystick. Nice. we got a joystick control. And if you remember, the Atari home computer uses an Atari joystick. The one joystick, one button. So you get to use that for a flight simulation on your home computer. And this is, I believe, one of the first ones we've checked out on the channel, a flight simulator for the Atari home computer. Uh, I don't want to consider something space, like uh, Star, Ra uh, uh, Star Raiders, because that was, it is using the joystick, you know, with uh, the, the feel of, of flying a, a spacecraft, but this is meant to be something more on Earth, using gravity. So there you go, it's showing you how, wow, all the different uh, controls for the joystick. And look at that, they're using even diagonal controls of the joystick and the button simultaneously to do functions. Oh my gosh. All right, so lots of complication here. We'll refer back to the manual if we need to. Let's boot this up and see what happens. First time trying out 747 Landing Simulator for the Atari 800 released at some point in 1981. Here we go. I don't know what's gonna happen. This might be like Top Gun for the NES and we crash. There we go. We got it to boot. That's always the first plan. No thanks to the Acorn Adam uh, getting bad cassette tapes and we can't play them. 
747 landing simulator. All right, so let's do this. Going in, I'm hitting enter, and oh, maybe it won't boot because I just tried enter and oh, enter spacebar did work. We're there. Okay, so it's giving us what time we are, flight level, flight number, and I wonder if we can switch. We can, okay? So if you look right above, uh, right to the side of my head, these are the buttons that you'd find on your Atari computer for uh, options, and, and kind of like the Atari console, you had the option to switch. You have the same thing here. You can see I'm doing which level of flight I want, and then what number would be, oh no, not that one, this one. Yeah, you can do instruments on or off. So you, this is me pushing the buttons on your Atari console to make the changes. We're just gonna start with flight number one and flight level of one, and then push start. Okay, we're going. We're gonna land. This is it. All right, so I'm using the joystick now, and it's responding. Oh yeah, it works. So I'm controlling the plane. If you look far enough in the distance, that's the runway, is my guess. But what? what is this, someone's attacking? What in the wait, wait, wait. The, 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 we didn't read the whole manual, but we have someone attacking us while we're trying to land. I thought it was a flight simulator. It's a combat game too? No way. They kind of streamlined the, the process. When you look down at the bottom, all of the instruments and uh, the user interface is a lot simpler than other flight simulators that we've seen. But there's not really a lot right now. Yeah, I don't know how to take this guy out. All right, I want to refer to the manual. You didn't tell me anything about guns. I thought this was a simulation of just landing. It's the 747 landing. Does the 747 even have a way to uh, take down enemies? All right, so we're only halfway through the manual after scrolling through everything and looking for anything involving how I can attack. So if you go into autopilot, which means pressing a button until autopilot displays, reduce airspeed by one integer, Airspeed necessary, runway approach. At final approach, press the trigger to return to manual mode. And then, okay, well, what about the attacking? Suggest a strategy for more experienced pilots. Oh, well, we're not experienced pilots, so we'll, we'll breeze by that one. And then what about flight level one? All right, so collision. Maybe I was colliding with another aircraft. It looked like a spacecraft. Yeah, maybe yeah, maybe we're <laughs> another airplane is taking off from the airport. <laughs> <laughs> and we're crashing into them. It looked a lot like a UFO from my side, though. Okay, I guess that makes sense. All right, let's try it again. Are we dead yet? Okay, we're dead. All right, going in again. This looks like a repeat of Top Gun on the NES. It's all starting here on Chronologically Gaming, and then every other time we're trying to land a plane, it's not going to work. All right, let's see. I have instrument error. That time I tried to do the autopilot like it told me. Let's give it another shot. No, if I hold down just the button, the, 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 the red button on my Atari controller, it's doing that instead of autopilot. Is there another one? There. Okay. Got it. Okay, so now I'm on autopilot. Let's see if I crash into another plane while I'm on autopilot. Because it still looks like I'm really far away from the runway. But you can see the range is counting down now. Altitude, I am dropping, but slowly and steady. Autopilot should be able to take care of that. The sound effects are pretty typical for what we hear for the time. It honestly sounds like TV static to me. <laughs> to have a flight simulator in 1981. For all the aficionados of flight simulator games, uh, oh, it's working though. The autopilot worked. Probably because when I had the joystick and I'm moving it around, I'm wiggling to the point that we're, we're gonna hit one of the other planes taking off, but it's working. Autopilot is doing the job. You can see we're getting closer to the runway. Altitude looks good. I want to see what happens when we try to land. So range counting down, we're about 47,000 feet away. Yep, and we're getting closer. It's zooming us in. T take a look at the... Gr oh, what? Oh, zero fuel. They didn't give us enough fuel to do autopilot in. Maybe autopilot uh, crashed at that point. But take a look at the graphics because um, flight simulators, we're going to see this evolution slowly progress and get better and better. Uh, on the home computer. All right, so that was 747 landing simulator. Even though we didn't land uh, the plane, uh, I still give it um, a, a above average for the time because uh, taking the, a game that you could play with an Atari joystick and streamlining the, the controls is, is pretty cool. So I'm going to do three and a half stars for 747 landing simulator. 
And with that, let's see what our next release is, going through all the games in 1981 in alphabetical order. Next place we're going is the Arcade. Excellent. So this is 800 Fathoms. If you remember when we started 1981, we got a slew of horizontally scrolling games. Defender being one of the kings of the horizontally scrolling. And this one is uh, looks like we're doing a Scramble or Super Cobra type game for, for this one. <laughs> wow, thanks, Mom. You played on my Atari computer. All right, let's take a look at the artwork for 800 Fathoms. Five-phase excitement in a thrilling underwater adventure by U.S. Billiards. Great screenshot blown up on the advertisement flyer. And there's the arcade cabinet. Looking really, uh, really nice. Artwork on the side looks pretty good. It's catchy. And this one also goes by the name of Mariner. Our controls are possibly four-way joystick and then fire and missile. And there's our arcade marquee. 800 Fathoms. With an example of the screenshot, we got a manual too. Technical manual. This might be only specs of 800 Fathoms, but let's see. Installation and starting. Da, da, da. We don't want to install anything and maintenance. Does it say anything about starting? No, it's literally plugging in and starting the cabinet. So we got the parts list for 800 Fathoms. Does it talk about the game? The dip switch is in the back. That's interesting. Uh, but no, looks like it is, it is literally the technical manual. So no information of them explaining the concept of the game. All right, we're going to the arcades. This is 800 Fathoms released at some point in 1981 by U.S. Billiards. There we go. All right, so um, we like to see a little bit of the attract mode to see what you see in the arcade first. So we're in the arcade. Here's the game. And this is the point where you decide, do you want to put a quarter in or not? You know, it explains the point system. And we have the mystery enemy. I'm looking at the top of the screen, and I see that they're doing the Super Cobra uh, path. <laughs> well, the attract mode isn't even playing the game. But it looks like they're going to let us play further and further as we go. And uh, probably the same thing for Mariner, which is the other title for this one. Yeah, all right. <laughs> all right, so let's put, in a, put a quarter in and play some 800 Fathoms. Pushing start. Oh, nice. Oh, I thought those were power-ups. I guess not. No sound effects for the power-ups, though. We got a little ditty in the beginning, but that was it. All right, so I have two controls. I got a, uh, a forward shot and then a bomb. Oh, and of course, I, I blew up on that one. Yeah, I don't have control. It's auto-scrolling. Uh, this one's going by itself. Background has a cool star field effect. I, I would say more like um, Moon Cresta. Can I blow those guys up? Yeah. All right, so mystery value looks like it's 100 points for that one. And then for shooting, I can't fire. Only my uh, missiles take those guys out. And they have a fuel gauge. I didn't see what was the fuel I need to blow. Okay, there it is. The round ones is the fuel. Oh, yeah, I wouldn't make it in time. So they, they're doing just like uh, Super Cobra. It's uh, going to play further and further as we go, but we're underwater now. So it's kind of like a underwater Super Cobra game. Same year as uh, Super Cobra, but I can't guarantee which one came out first. There's no way to say that Mariner or 800 Fathoms was released before this, uh, I mean, before Super Cobra. We checked that one out because I just knew of the release. Okay, now let's actually play something. What's the point of the forward shot if nothing works? Can I use the forward shot down here? Okay, there we go. Works on that. That worked. I, I get that. And we're getting fires for the shot, but for the time, the, the one thing I'd say it's missing is a sound throughout. We're not getting a constant sound like the Namco games. They give us either blips and bloops or something really cool. Oh, here we go. Now we can use forward facing shot. Loving the firepower here. And it looks like we got a boss. Nice. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, the forward-facing shot is no sound. And now we're moving on to the next stage. If you look at the top of the screen, it's 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 showing you what's coming up or what level we're on, which has been uh, really interesting in the arcades to see us, hey, let's go to the next level. Now I want to know if it saves our position like it did in Fantasy, where we can keep going where we left off because Super Cobra, you had to be good. You had to just keep going. Yep, trying to get me right there. Not not a chance. Yeah, the, the way you shoot fire, firing forward is awesome. And then here we go. We go, go to another boss. 
And you can see where I am at the top of the screen. Looks like we've got another life because we made it to 10,000 points. Nice. It's essentially a shoot 'em up aww, horizontally scrolling, and then every level they introduce something new, a new place or a new enemy. And it looks like you have to be really good to keep going. And not follow the same... Oh, it's homing. Okay, okay. Yeah, that one's going to... The other one's going to do it too. No way. And if you don't shoot the fuel at the bottom, then you're going to run into... They did this in Super Cobra, where I'd play, and if I was getting really good for, and and realized that they're not giving me a lot of fuel, you have to get the fuel or you won't make it. All right, here we go, busting through. Cool idea with that mini boss at the end. Feels a little empty with the sound, but I can't blame that because it, it's possible that that's the emulation. All right, so we're still going now. We're almost in the other 10,000. I hope that we can get that before we... I didn't hear the sound like I got a, got a life that time. Wow. <laughs> Wait, what happened? I didn't see what shoot. Did I go to the top and die? No, no. Maybe I missed something because I... I'm telling you, doing this as a live show while you're talking about the game and reviewing the game at the same time is very difficult. Because once you get in the, in the zone, you can play so much better. But to talk through it... Oh, I see. It was one of those little bullets that got me. Yep, it was those teeny tiny bullets uh, that I could barely see. Yeah, or the electro shot. Oh, maybe it was because they electrocuted the water. Okay, so let's see what happens if we put a coin in again. So put another quarter in, and now I'm pushing start. Does it start me from the very beginning again? It doesn't. It took over where we left off. Okay, so we didn't go to the very beginning, which means this is another game that we could continue to play if we got enough money. But I don't know what, what was up with the electric shock. Why did I die from that? Yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm missing the electric shock part. I don't get that part. Why am I dying? Maybe because I'm supposed to wipe out everything on the screen, and if I don't, then that's it. yeah. I'm. I don't see what's what's killing me. Maybe it's because I'm passing by this guy. No, I tried it again to see what would happen, but it didn't work. Let me see if I can see what it is. Yeah, I'm not seeing what the electric shock part is. The background star field is really blending in with the shots. Because the if, if you see when they shoot back at me, it's one pixel the same size as the star field. And here we go. I'm doing fine. Oh, maybe I killed something I shouldn't have killed. I see. So they, they were putting enemies that I have to avoid shooting. And that's what I did. I probably shot something that electrocuted the water and I'm not supposed to shoot them. Of course. How was I supposed to know that? Oh my gosh, yeah, now we're getting into uh, even newer enemies going even further in the game. Okay, yeah, this is fun. This is another one of those games I want to keep playing because I want to keep going further and further and see the next one. So, uh, last try playing 800 Fathoms. Starting off with three lives, and yes, we get to take over where we left off. That's awesome. So if you got enough money from your parents, you can just keep playing arcade games. What a concept. We haven't seen a lot of games do that. All right, I gotta get these. I don't think I can. I, the missiles go right through them. Invincible mana rays? Yeah, it's just avoid them. Take a couple of fuel. Wow, yeah. It is uh, no way to knock them out. Just get out of their way, I guess. Wow, yeah. It's, it's it, tricky to dodge them, but man, I want to keep going. I want to keep playing it. So that is 800 Fathoms. That is a blast, and a throwback to what we played in early 1981 when we knew the release dates. So this one is uh, definitely up there. Four stars for sure. Um, if you remember, we gave uh, Super Cobra 5 and Defender 5. Yeah, and um, it doesn't say continue on the screen. Good point. It just said you put a quarter in, and if you do, you keep playing where you left off, which is awesome. But uh, because of that, uh, I'm going to go four and a half stars for 800 Fathoms. One of the best games you could play at the time, and this horizontally scrolling thing, I think it's going to catch on. It's been the theme of 1981 Arcade, at least for the shooters. 
All right, and after that, let's see what our next release is after 800 Fathoms. All right, we're going back to England, playing our ZX81. This is Adventure A, Planet of Death. Planet of Death. That's an awesome title. Let's take a look at the box for Planet of Death. Yes. On the ZX81. This one's by Arctic Computing. And as usual, the box is just the cassette tape that you would have gotten at the time. And I believe that's it. Is that all we got for our work? Oh, we got different types of uh, boxes. So there's two variations of it. Another great adventure for the 16K ZX81. Also available from Arctic Computing. And this would what you'd see on the sleeve of the cassette. So somewhere out there, uh, there's someone in Europe that is getting nostalgia feels right now. Or maybe they didn't. All right, let's pop it in and see. This is Adventure A, Planet of Death, released at some point in 1981 for the ZX81. And as usual, we well, actually, this is not usual. Uh, I'm not used to seeing this on the cassette tape. I wonder if we're going to get another like Acorn Atom cassette tape and it's not going to be a good one. This looks like we're about to uh, load up a, v a VHS tape. All right, so let's push uh, R on our keyboard. Yes, that is what the keyboard looks like on the ZX81 and run. And no, we got a bad cassette tape. No. So if anyone has the cassette tape for uh, Planet of Death, I really want to visit Planet of Death, but I just can't. So we're going to give that one zero stars, sadly, and move on to our next release. Goodbye, Planet of Death. Let's move on to Adventure B. This is the Inca Curse for the ZX81. If you look in the bottom left corner, that uh, image is actually kind of blown up. Uh, the ZX81 is very small, and uh, Sinclair was popular for bringing uh, calculators first. So the ZX80 and the ZX81 were kind of like a larger calculator, in a sense, because it was it was kind of tiny. Considering the other computers we've seen, especially when you look at like the Atari 800 or the IBM PC, this one is minuscule. All right, let's see if we got a good cassette for Adventure B, the Inca Curse. Let's take a look at the box for the Inca Curse. Really cool there. Oh, it has a watermark on it. So again, by Arctic Computing. And any other images for the Inca Curse? Yeah, it looks like it's two versions again. Same game, just different flavors with the sleeve on the cassette. Nice. And no manual again. I don't think we have uh, many manuals for the ZX81. Here we go. We're popping the cassette tape and playing. Adventure B, released at some point in 1981. Yes, we have a good one. Welcome to Adventure B, Inca Treasure. Your aim is to collect as much treasure as you can from the Inca Temple, a la Colossal Cave, the very first adventure. You may instruct the computer with short sentences and useful words like help, get, put, use, with, climb, score, inventory. Yeah, like text adventure games. Dedicated to Charles. Thanks, Charles. Press any key to continue. Do we want to restore a game? No. What was that like to restore a game on the ZX81? I'm in a jungle clearing. Exits are south. Only have one exit? That's easy. I can also see a branch. Get that branch. Wow, I can't type fast. Branch. There we go. You have to remember this keyboard is a little bitty compared to the other ones, and it's those spongy uh, chiclet keys. It's heavy with lots of leaves. Tell me what to do. Uh, get leaves oh it's jerking every single time i type a, type a letter get leaves and at this point we could talk about refresh rate because everything we've seen in north america and japan is running at 60 hertz and now that we go to europe we've seen this with releases on the philips video pack for the home console space but this computer as well as the other consoles this is running at 50 hertz so if you think something's off or weird with the uh, the speed of these games, that's because they're in the PAL territory, running s slightly slower than in uh, the NTSC territory. <laughs> I think so, because that's what it seems like it's doing after I type. It's refreshing every time. Oh, we can't get the leaves. Okay, so let's go south. Does S work? Yes, okay, S works. I'm on the temple steps. Exits are north. I can also see a latch door on the steps. Go south again. You can't go in that direction. Go east. Go west. Okay, open. Yeah, every time I type, it's refreshing the screen. Every key command. And if you can hear the keyboard clicks from my microphone, 
that don't be deceived. The ZX81, there were no clicks. You didn't hear anything when you were typing. It was just silence because it was spongy keys. I can't do that yet. I hate it when they say that. What do you mean you can't? Um, use latch. I can't. Tell me what to do. Go south. I can't go in. Can you go in any direction? Can you only go north? Can you go back where you were? I'm in the jungle clearing and they still see a branch. Although we picked up a branch with leaves. So we're uh, getting in the realm of another adventure game, a text adventure game that you could play for the time. And if you had uh, the ZX81 and this was the adventure game for you, I would be that person that would want to play, get further. And you can see they give us the commands in the beginning. I love that when they tell you what you can type. That's the that's one of the best things. So for the time, I'm going to give that one um, average for the time. Uh, three stars for Inca Curse. And while we don't dive deep into text adventure games and see which one is like the better lore or better well written, we, we will uh, play a little bit longer on some others. But uh, for these, we're just kind of uh, uh, breezing through and getting a taste of some of the games. All right, so that was Inca Curse. Let's move forward and see what our next release is in alphabetical order. Here we go. This is the Adventure Trilogy on the Coco. For this one, we didn't have... Uh, a box that we could find, but we did find um, some advertisements. This is uh, one in, I think, Color... Uh, no, this was possibly in Rainbow Magazine. So this is Adventure Trilogy. You can see in the bottom right with a bunch of other things from Color Quest, who made this one. And then another one for the ad just for uh, Adventure Trilogy with some uh, bl cool black and white artwork with uh, the t just the original TRS-80 in the bottom corner. And there's some screenshots for us. For this one, we have a manual. We love those on the computer. By Nelson Software Systems. Here we go. Adventure Trilogy. And if you see copyright 1982, it's because it was in better syndication then. And this is the, f the first time you could play it was, I believe, near the end of 1982. And I'm sure L. Curtis B. will correct me if I'm wrong. So there we go. Loading instructions. We already know how to load the game. The adventure begins. Oh, man. Now we're getting the lore. This is the second age of Mandarule. You're, you're living in the realm of wonder beneath the Simeon moon. Oh my gosh. As one of the royal room... Oh my god. <laughs> That's too many diphthongs. You're a great lord warrior, the Overleer. The sword you wield is the mighty O-sword. O-sword, which can release powerful fireballs upon command. Okay, that's cool. Once you've proved your worthiness in combat, you'll be sent on a quest to restore the Eye of Dasmore to its resting place in the Forsaken Gulch. I feel like I should be reading this like a nerd. You'll be sent on a quest to restore the Eye of Dasmore mm. in its resting place in Forsaken Gulch. The Eye of Dasmore is located beneath the castle Argon, somewhere within the perilous White Void. So our adventure is to go in the White Void, get this crystal, and get out of there. Yes, and bring it back to this resting place in the Forsaken Gulch. All right, so the commands we can play for this one is attack, extinguish, fireball, high, jump, knock, light, listen, open, parry, press, pull, rest, search, take, tap. Wow, uh, pretty impressive uh, for what you could do for the time. <laughs> mm, I don't know. What is that voice? If I had glasses on, it, it would work. But uh, secretly, I really want to see what Adventure Trilogy is about. So let's pop it in. Oh, by the way, I love this ad for the TRS-80 color computer. It has um, like different people in the house of why you would need the computer. Because in 1981, you really didn't need a computer yet. In, in my opinion, like n no one needed. You could do most of the stuff on the computer you could with a, a, a pad of paper. And so they were trying to sell and get people to bring it inside. They, they show all these people... Uh, at home, and this little girl is flipping out over the color computer. She's like, oh my gosh, there's an arcade game, and I'm just, I, I had too much sugar. Um. <laughs> All right, so let's let's play some Adventure Trilogy, released at some point in 1981 for the Coco. Here we go, first time booting it up. Let's see what's on the disc. <laughs> All right, so this one is machine language. We love that. It loads fast. Trilogy. Here we go. The Adventure Trilogy. World Under the Simeon Moon, Dasmore's Underworld of Doom, Forsaken Gulch. By Kevin Herbolt and Tim Nelson. Way to go, Kevin and Tim. 
ready to play some adventure trilogy and if we don't know the commands we have the manual which is why we love that for home computer games and we, not, we don't necessarily have the time to read all the lore for these games because oh man oh man they go deep I guess space bar there it is greetings Ovenlier Ovenlorier you've been elected to engage in ceremonial combat to the death may you triumph for Mandor we love Mandor here oh is that me or is that who I'm fighting all right, so let's try the one of the commands was attack. So if I just oh there it is a t t a t t no I said a t t there we go keyboard controls <gasps> we've been hit so it's a first person perspective but um, is that it a okay I can do attack again a c k Yes, the Narthox is dead. Oh man, but this guy's bigger. I don't know if we can take him out. So this, I thought it was us that we were looking at, but no, this is, we are us and we're looking at these guys. And I think we're like a gladiator right now. And we have to finish these fights before we can actually start our quest. All right, so Narthox is dead. Then we got this guy. Can I look at him? I didn't see if that was a command. I might be messing something up if I do this. Yeah, unknown command. I thought it was going to make me dead. Like if I spend time looking at the guy, he would uh, kill me. All right, let's attack him. Go! We hit! Nice! We don't see any animation of him attacking, but that's pretty standard for the time. A-T, yes, and get him! Uh, it didn't say if we won or not. Can we do it again? No, we can't. And these home computers, there's not like a up on the cursor to reset your uh, command. Uh, unless there's a trick that uh, L. Curtis B knows to, to make just... Can I just use attack again without having to type the whole thing again? On the Coco, I'm not familiar with it. We hit! Yes! Keep going. Finish the battle. Let's go. <laughs> Thanks for the feedback. <laughs> I didn't think so, because at this time, there wasn't a way to repeat the command you had. The only one I could think of is IBM PC, but I think it was a later model that allowed you to do that. And we hit again, yes. So I'm just repeating attacking. It almost feels like I'm playing a typing simulator. Yes, we hit, go, keep going. Oh wait, you know what I should do is the fireball. My sword has a fireball. Attack, yes, oh yes, fireball. Go. Shoot the fireball. Oh, I don't know if it hit or not, but fireball again. Yeah, it feels like I'm playing a typing uh, a tutor game. Fireball, yes, it hit. Because the, the, the game itself is starting off with just keyboard commands, but you got to give it credit because it's not only text. We've, we've seen games where you're putting these commands in and that's it, uh, you have only text. And this one has a cool picture we can go with, too. Kill! Kill! Oh, man. He's still not dead? How long is this guy going to take? Yes! We defeated the to 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 Toamoth. The Toamoth is dead. All right, what happens now? Read diskette. Press any key. Press any key. Okay. Where's the any key? And now we're at the castle. Is that now where we type commands? So if this is like a text adventure game, then it's gonna have directions like if I say north. Oh no, it's gonna let me move next. So consulting the manual for adventure trilogy. If I go to commands, there we go. So it looks like uh, first thing you do is we have to attack, hide, lump, uh, arrow key. Okay, arrow keys is to move around. No way. Is it really arrow keys? <gasps> Whoa, that's pretty cool. Oh, yeah, and I moved forward in the arrow key, and I went in the building. And now I'm in the building. So can I move? Wow, that's pretty cool. So I'm using the arrow keys to turn around, but I don't have every... What? That's awesome. So what, what's happening is I'm able to use the arrow keys to walk and move around. It's it's very similar to a Calabeth. If I had to say, like, see, look at this. And it's giving me like a three-dimensional room to look through. 
And the, if you're familiar with these kinds of games from a first person perspective, you, you look one direction. Yeah, you can see there's a door up ahead. <laughs> I think it's the door I came in. Yes, there is a door there. Do we type door? Door. Oh, open. The door is locked. Uh, unlock. Uh, I don't even know if I have a key. No. Okay, so you got to go find the key and then open the door. But you can see I'm moving around in a 3D uh, space. First person perspective. Sometimes the key commands are not responding. Let me see. Okay, yeah, it's it's it, it's just a little bit slow, I, I would say. Maybe it's a little bit. But yeah, much faster than 3D 3D in Europe. Yeah, open door didn't work because it's locked. So let's try uh, going a different way. Down the hallway. I want to see how, how you fight someone from this, this way. And whenever I'm in the middle of the room, it's just orange. That's all I have. To show we're playing on the color computer, I guess. Until you can see the wall. So the, the walls don't even show up until you get to a certain place. And then go up the stairs. And this is us going to another floor. Oh, cool effect right there. <laughs> what, what happens? I don't know what this is. Look. Am I warping to another floor? There's also no sound, so it looks like uh, we're just having an, a random acid trip in the middle of this dungeon. Whoa, man. That dwarf gave me something bad. I don't know what I'm going to do. Yeah, so I think we're going to another floor. Yeah, the arrow key. Oh, so our oh, it's blocking our way. So I try to move into it. Once I try to walk into it, then it doesn't let me pass. You shall not pass. Okay, so but then we're back outside and we move our way in. But this is pretty cool. Um, the, the When we played a Calabeth, that allowed us to go down to a dungeon. When we were down in the dungeon, then it went to first person. But it's a cool feeling to be in a game where you're outside of a building like that tower. And when we move forward, we go right inside. And now we're in the building. And we're, 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 we're tra traversing around in here. <laughs> yes, I know there's a wall there. Thanks. Yeah, one of the commands is different. And then I'm back in the same spot. So yeah, I could have spent a lot longer on this one because this one is a game that you could really play uh, getting that feeling of being from a first-person perspective. So uh, I got to give Adventure Trilogy higher than average because uh, the only other RPGs we've seen taking that approach, and, and it is doing typing commands, um, but, it's, but it's better than uh, Temple of Apshai and other role-playing games that have you do commands for everything. Oh, I see. So when you ever get a torch, you would get uh, to see more of, of the maze. That's awesome. Yeah, for for 1981, uh, I love the effect. So um, it's not up there as like one of the best uh, role playing games you could play, uh, but it is it, it is high in my in my book. So I'm gonna go four stars compared to everything else we've seen up to this point in 1981. All right, so now let's move on to our next game after Adventure Trilogy. Where are we going now? All right, we're going to Microsoft DOS. So back to the IBM PC world, and this is Adventureland. And we've already seen Adventureland. It is uh, the first of Scott Adams' adventure games, but this is for the IBM PC. Let's see what the box looks like. Yes. Looks like this one is uh, actually the Atari one because uh, the IBM PC, I don't even think it had a box. Okay, but the, the back is similar to what we've seen before. For Adventureland by Scott Adams. This takes the Colossal Cave example. Let's go get treasure and come back. Very bare bones. Very, very simple. I think you follow the stream just like in Colossal Cave. Same idea. Uh, this was for the IBM PC though. So let's see what happens. Yes. I'm in a forest. Obvious exits for north, south, east, and west. Take a look at those graphics. Yes. Welcome to adventure number one. Adventureland. In this adventure, you'll find treasures and store them away. To see how well you're doing, say score. <gasps> how well am I doing? Uh, on a scale of 1 to 100, you we rate a 0. We're a 0. So tell us what you want to do. And if you look at all the Adventure Land games by, or all the Adventure games by Scott Adams, always have at the top, which they've given us as orange, uh, for one section of, of what we see and what we're looking at. And the bottom is all the, um, uh, the, the, the text crawl. 
So I'm in a forest and we have all these exits and we see trees. E, uh, get tree. It's beyond my power to do that. Oh man, I can finally type fast. Thank you. So north should work. Okay, so now in this game, whenever you move north, you just do it. So you see, I moved north and now it says, okay, we're there. And now we're mapping it out. When I play some of these adventure games where you're not able to see it and you're supposed to imagine it, I just think, come on, King's Quest. I know you're going to come out sometime. 1984, I think it is. Just wait. So let's go north again, north again. And you can see I'm just in a forest with trees. So I guess north won't work. Let's try east. Now we're in a sunny meadow. We see a large sleeping dragon. A sign says, in many cases, mud is good. In others, dot, 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 poke. Dragon. Does that work? Nothing happens. So you can't poke the dragon. Sorry. All right. So now we're east and we're now on the shore of a lake. You can also see water and a golden fish, a rusty axe with the word bunion on it, and a sign that says no swimming allowed here. Swim. Not here. Okay. It won't let me swim. Uh, what about get fish? Okay. The fish have escaped back to the lake. Darn. We, so we couldn't get the fish. Okay. So how about get axe? Okay, we got the axe. Look, axe. Does that work? Okay, I see nothing special. What if we say bunion? Bunion is a word I don't know. Sorry. Oh, okay. That doesn't work. <laughs> oh, if you wake dragon, it'll work. Okay, let's go back to wake dragon. Let's do west. Sunny meadow, sleeping dragon. Here we go. Wake dragon. Nothing happens. Maybe if I threw something. Uh, throw axe? No. Oh, cool. That's cool that caps lock works. Throw axe. I'm not carrying axe. What? Take inventory. What do I have? Wait, I thought I had an axe. Oh, the axe. Wait, get axe. Maybe it dropped it for me. Oh, if I say throw axe, maybe it just throws it on the ground instead of throwing it at the dragon. These are text adventure games that only are two word parsers. So if I tried to say throw axe at dragon, it would not understand. That's how rudimentary we are with as far as adventure games go. The only thing I've seen more complex would be Zork as an example. They accept adjectives uh, and you can do more than just two words. But this one's just bare bones, very simple um, for the time. Uh, so let's go east again. And we're at the shore of the lake where there's our fish. And I want to follow this lake uh, south. We're at the edge of a bottomless hole. So this is how most of these adventure games, the, the, the originals, we're talking the mainframe computers, worked. You'd uh, explore a little bit outside, start walking around, and then you'd find a stream. The stream would lead down to a hole. The hole would lead to where you go to mazes, and those mazes would help you collect treasure. And that would be your adventure. Going to get the treasure, and then you come back and usually deliver it to some place. And that's what Adventure Land is. That's what, that's what it's going to do. Oh, if you do uh, if you do all of that, I this one's so simple. I don't even know if that'll work. So um, there's also an advertisement here. Read advertisement. <laughs> it's an advertisement for another Scott Adams game. Pirate Adventure. They don't carry adventure. Have them call 305-862-6917. Quick, someone call that now and tell me what happens. So we're at the bottom list hole. Can we go go hole? No, wait. I'm on the ledge just below the rim of the bottomless hole. I don't think I want to go down. Oh, I do want to go down. Oh, you can see flint and steel. Get flint. Okay. Oh, it worked. Okay. And then let's go down. D. What happens? The game crashed. <laughs> when we went down the hole, I guess that's death. And <laughs> maybe that's why they told us don't go down the hole. So uh, whenever you play Adventureland, don't go down the hole. They warned us. But we did anyway and went down the hole. So that is the one of the uh, releases of Adventureland at some point in 1981. And if you look here, as uh, I'm, I'm looking ahead a little bit, we have two more versions of Adventureland that we'll check out and then continue on playing all our releases released at some point in 1981. So we'll pause the show now. There's always more games to play that we'll be checking out. We're living in 1981. I'm stuck here in 1981. I won't be getting out until we play all the games. So until then, we will see you next time. Hey everybody, thanks for checking out the channel and joining me on my quest to play every single video game in order of release. We'll be streaming live every weekday at 9pm Central, so join us and let us know if we miss any games along the way. 
This video would not be possible without RetroArch and LaunchBox. Please tell your friends there's some crazy guy out there trying to play every single video game. You can always check out Chronologically Gaming on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram. Chronologically Gaming is the name to look for. We will catch you next time.